So welcome to the Ollie Lecture Series with Helen Harrison. Um, Helen is the director of the Paula Krasner House and Study Center. Uh, before she became the director, she was the curator of the Parish Art Museum and Guildhall Museum and a guest curator at the Queens Museum in Flushing. Um, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Helen, who's going to give us uh, the Picasso and Pollock lecture. Oh, thank you, Liz. I'm very happy to be back with Ollie. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. It's such a lively group. And what I'm going to do is start with a short PowerPoint just to give you some background about Picasso's influence on Pollock. And then I'm going to do a little walk around the museum where the exhibition, which officially closed on October 31st, is still installed because almost all of the works in the exhibition are replicas not original Pollocks or Krasners, although we do have a few, but there are copies of works that Pollock painted in response to, or created in response to Picasso, and also works by Picasso that influenced him. So I was very um, mindful of the fact that he would have seen these particular works in person that this was not something that he just saw in reproduction, although he did see a lot of Pollock's work, uh, Picasso's work in reproduction during the 1930s. So uh, let me just go to the PowerPoint. I'm gonna share my screen. And go to slideshow if I can find it, it's hiding. There we go. Okay. Now here are our boys, Picasso and Pollock, who never met. Picasso did come to the United States, uh, but not until after Pollock died. Uh, Picasso was oh, over 20 years older than, than Pollock, but it has to be remembered that Pollock is by no means the only American artist of his generation. Oh. And subsequent generations and previous generations who were influenced by Picasso. Picasso was the protean artistic talent of the 20th century. In fact, there's a cute anecdote that Lee Krasner used to tell about Pollock and his, his reaction to Picasso. When they were living together, before they moved out here and got married uh, in the early 1940s, they had a studio uh, in New York City on 8th Street and her studio was in the back of the apartment and his was in the front. And she said she heard a noise in the front of the building and it, like a thump. And she went to the studio to see what had happened. And there was Pollock sitting on a chair and on the floor was a book of Picasso's work. And she said, what happened? And he said, that guy missed nothing. So there was no idea, no innovation, nothing that you could think of to do as a, as a modern artist that Picasso hadn't already thought of and hadn't already done. And one of the challenges for this generation of artists was to overcome Picasso after absorbing what he had to teach them. So although they were not his students literally, they were studying his work and trying to find a way around it, a way through it, a way beyond it. And for many people believe that, that Pollock was the one who really did that, who broke with the European tradition, got over cubism and was able to come up with something very original and new. So I'm gonna show you, I hope, let's see if I can make it work. This is our Pollock painting. We only own this one painting of Pollock's. The, the house, I don't know if all of you know the background, but the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center is where Jackson and Lee lived and worked from 1945 until their deaths. And it belongs to the Stony Brook Foundation. It was deeded to Stony Brook by Lee's estate in 1987. It came with its contents, the studio and the house. And so we have all of the environment in which they lived and worked. And you see behind me the kitchen, very much the way Lee left it, except we did not get their art. That went to set up the Pollock Krasner Foundation, which is a separate organization, and they give grants to artists. But in 2000, we were given this little Pollock painting. It's only 12 inches tall and 20 inches wide. And it was painted in New York City in the 1930s when Pollock was very much under Picasso's influence and influences of other um, 
people and, and things that you can see in here, some Native American influence. He was very interested in that. Also, Jose Clemente Orozco, the Mexican muralist. Uh, you can see his very expressionistic influence. But if you look up here, right here, you see a kind of stylized horse's head with the teeth coming out and the ear. Well, this comes straight out of Picasso. So we have had this painting for about 20 years. And two years ago, Claude Picasso, uh, Paul, Picasso's son and his wife, Sylvie came to visit the museum. And we were discussing this painting. And I said, your father's influence is in there. And he said, yes, of course. And I said, wouldn't it be fun to do a show and compare the two? And he said, I will help you. So he was very helpful in getting us permission to reproduce the important Picassos that were necessary to make the exhibition make sense. And of course, with our connection with the Pollock Krasner Foundation, we were able to have a, a good dialogue with them and they agreed to let us reproduce any of the Pollocks that we wanted to. So we did. And let me get to the next slide. Here is Jackson in his studio. Uh, this is the studio in New York City on 8th Street where the building is no longer there. But during the 1930s and early 1940s was when Picasso was the most influential on him as he was developing, as you can see in the background, surrealist influence, figurative imagery that was very symbolic, very pictographic, but very expressionistic as well. And a lot of the exhibitions and things that he would have seen in the city during that period featured Picasso's work. Right around the corner from where he lived was the Museum of the Gallery of Living Art, which became the Museum of Living Art in 1936. And it was a private collection by A.E. Gallatin, and it was in the NYU Library in the building that is now the Gray Gallery. And it included work by all the important modernists, and it was just a, a beacon for a lot of the younger artists who were trying to absorb this. And there, here it was firsthand, not just in, in magazines or in books, but there was very little in other museums. But this one opened in 1927, so it was really the earliest opportunity for most of these young artists to experience this work in person. One of the Gallatin works is the one on the left. You see there Picasso's still life with a pipe, a violin, and a bottle of bass. And there you see the label for the beer bottle. Now, this work was featured in the Gallatin collection at NYU. Pollock definitely saw it. And he also saw the still life with chair caning, which now belongs to the Musée Picasso, but was in Picasso's collection when there was a big retrospective of his work in 1939 in New York. And I'll get to that in a little more detail. But you can see that there was a way that he was trying to respond to Picasso, but make it his own. And of course, this was the key, because if you were simply aping or copying Cubism, you were just a neo-Cubist. You were just a follower. You were not an innovator. And in order to become an innovator, of course, you had to work your way through these other influences. Now, the Valentine Gallery was a very important venue for Picasso's work during the 1930s. And he did so, seven solo exhibitions, and there were over 14 exhibitions between 1930 and 1939, featuring, <clears throat> excuse me, featuring Picasso's work in New York City. So there was plenty of exposure. Also, uh, Pollock had a good friend named John Graham, a, a fellow artist, but he was actually Russian by birth and he came to New York and really spread the word about Cubism, about modernism, and wrote this book, System and Dialectics of Art, of which Pollock had a copy inscribed to him. And he and Graham used to discuss Picasso. Graham was a big Picasso fan although he eventually kind of turned on him and decided he wasn't so great after all. But during the 30s, he was the, the proselytizer. And he encouraged Pollock to study Picasso, to learn from him and to um, visit all the exhibitions and to basically try to not to copy Picasso, but to, to get to absorb what Picasso had to give him. And here you see a couple of examples of what he was doing at the time. You can definitely see the Picasso influence. 
and whoops, I missed one. There were two very important Picasso paintings that were acquired by the Museum of Modern Art around this time. One, of course, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, which is quite a large picture and very famous, very important. MoMA purchased it in 1939 when they did the retrospective, which I will also discuss. And Pollock actually told his friends that his painting, Gothic of 1944, was based in part on Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Now you can see the imagery is completely different, but there is a compositional similarity, that interweaving of shapes, and there's a kind of energy in it that evidently came from Picasso as well. And another very influential picture, Girl Before a Mirror, was I, I have actually seen almost direct copies of this painting made by colleagues of, of Pollock uh, growing up at that time and being very much taken with this picture, the way the foreground and the background interact, the curving shapes. This is actually a portrait of Picasso's mistress, Marie-Thérèse Voltaire, and it had a very strong influence. Pollock, of course, was interested in this kind of curvilinear expression and in masked image, you can see it reflected, but also Native American art, which was interesting to him, the masks of the masked image derive from um, Inuit artwork. So it's a compositional um, strategy, but Pollock is imposing his own imagery on it. It's not a copy, it's kind of a, a, uh, an inspiration. But for our purposes, Guernica is probably the most significant influence because of the horse's head. As you see here, the screaming horse is echoed in our tiny Pollock. This painting is 25 feet wide. This is enormous. And it came to New York in 1939. Uh, it was exhibited at originally, I'm gonna show you its original location at the World's Fair in Paris in 1937. It was painted for the Spanish pavilion. Now Picasso had been commissioned to paint a mural for the pavilion and he was working on it. He didn't know what he was going to do, but in April of 1939, the Basque village of Guernica was bombed by the German Luftwaffe on behalf of the Spanish nationalists. And it was a terrible tragedy, uh, of course, Picasso being Spanish, you know, he had a terrible, strong reaction to it. And he created this mural for the pavilion. And what it does is memorialize this uh, massacre of this, these innocent villagers using very stark black and white and gray. It is not a colored picture. If you see black and white illustrations of it, that's the color that it actually is. And down below there, you see the location that it was in the building. And right here in front of it, this object is a fountain by Alexander Calder. But instead of water, it mercury, liquid mercury flowed through it. So this was quite a, a stunning installation. After the World's Fair closed in Paris, the, the painting went on tour to raise funds for the Spanish Republican cause. Uh, they were the duly elected government, the nationalists were overthrowing them, and in fact, they did overthrow them. And by the time the picture came to New York in 1939, the Spanish Republicans uh, had been defeated. So the painting was used to raise funds for Spanish refugee relief. And it was shown at the Valentine Gallery in New York in, in May, then it went on a national tour, and then it came back to New York for the, Pollock, uh, the Picasso retrospective, in November of 1939. Everybody went to see it. And as a child, I remember seeing it. it, it actually came back to MoMA and stayed in MoMA until 1981. So any of you uh, like me who have grown up in New York would have seen it many, many times over that 40 year period. But when it came to New York, I, Lee Krasner, when she saw it at the Valentine Gallery, she said, she had to leave the building and walk around the block a couple of times just to clear her head because it was so, so riveting, so stunning. And it, 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 was, it was so influential that a lot of people felt that no one was going to be able to get over Picasso because this thing was so strong. 
And there it is in the original installation at MoMA. And there it is many years later, 1962, with uh, the MoMA, uh, he's the founding director who became the curator of the collection, Alfred Barr, sitting in front of it. And this was something that for, for Pollock, right at this time, he was commissioned to paint his own mural. There's a re press release from MoMA noting that the painting was coming back from its national tour and it was installed on the 26th of July, 1943, just as Pollock had been given a commission from Peggy Guggenheim to paint a mural for her townhouse. And there he is standing in front of the canvas. It was 20 feet wide. What is he gonna put on it? As you can see, it's blank. So he's gotta make up his mind what kind of a design he's going to do. Now, most of Pollock's work is done spontaneously without any preliminary sketches or drawings. But in this case, he decided to just work up a concept. And there you see it, that little drawing at the top. Now, the drawing itself is only about 18 inches wide and Guernica is 25 feet wide. But you can see that he is parroting some of the imagery. Here you have this mother and child, uh, she's clutching this dead child. And here you have a figure clutching something with its right arm. Here you have the light bulb with its glare. Here you have something radiating up here. Uh, this woman who's falling from the burning building, her hands are flying up in the air. And here you see a hand flying up in the air. So it's clear that Pollock was looking at Guernica and trying to adapt or reconfigure some of that imagery in his own terms. He wound up doing nothing like Guernica, a completely different composition, which you see here for Peggy, uh, which was done in 1943. And this is now in the collection of the University of Iowa. But this thing is, as you can see, a completely different concept, very curvilinear, very colorful, uh, as, as distinct from the Guernica imagery. But you can really understand how important it was for Pollock to see these examples, to overcome them and create something that was uniquely his own. So that's the end of my slideshow. And let me close it out. And now I'd like to take you around and show you the exhibition, the installation is in, in the house itself. We don't have a separate gallery. This is our little painting. Oh, why is it not showing up? Because I'm not pointing it correctly. Ah, there we go. It's supposed to adjust automatically. It's a little hard to see, but this is the painting I showed you at the beginning, which was given to us by Margaret Weinstock and which was the inspiration for the exhibition. If anybody has any questions, oh, that's better. If anyone has any questions while we're walking around, please feel free to, to jump in. Uh, I guess Liz can unmute you. We can also take questions in the chat if you'd like. Yeah. Now, here is a study for the horse's head. And as you can see, it's very close to what Pollock came up with. And here is a 10 foot size replica of Guernica. All the other works in the show are the same size as they, as they are in, in reality, but Guernica wouldn't fit in the house <laughs> in its full size. So we made a replica that's a little bit under half size. And down here on the table, we have some of the documents that we, the Valentine Gallery catalog, Pollock's own book on Picasso and the catalog of the MoMA show. So just a few documents to give people a little bit of background. And why did Pollock decide he no longer liked Picasso? Oh, it was John Graham. John Graham was the one who said, uh, he, he decided that Picasso was passe. But Pollock, he always respected Picasso and he, he never uh, repudiated him, but he couldn't be just a clone of Picasso. He had to be his, his own man and do his own work. And if he couldn't come up with something original, there was no point. 
so here are the three that I showed you earlier. The painting from the gallery, the, it's a collage actually from the Gallatin collection and Pollock's little response to it. And Majoli down there that uh, it's actually a collage with chair caning or it's fake chair caning and it's surrounded by a rope. And this was in the, Pollock ret the, the Picasso retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. And also I'll show you the rest of the room. Here we have, okay. let me back off a little Muted. bit, see it better. This is Picasso, uh, excuse me, Pollock's, I keep confusing those two guys, uh, mm -hmm. Pollock's only mosaic. Now, this is not the original. I don't know how to respond to that. I'm sorry? Uh, so, someone said something, I didn't quite hear it. I think somebody's trying to connect their audio. Oh, I see. okay. Well, let me can continue then. This this was done for the WPA Federal Art Project in the 1930s or very early 40s. Uh, Pollock and Krasner and practically that whole generation worked on this federal program, which was a, a it was subsidizing the artists to do their own work. Actually, paid them a living wage to do it from 1935 to 1943. And he did this for a building. It would have been inset into a wall, but it was rejected or for whatever reason, it was not installed. And we did have the original here. This is just a copy, but we had the original mosaic in the exhibition. It was lent to us by Pollock's estate. It still owned it. And it's, uh, as you can see, definitely a Picasso influence. And also the one I showed you over here. This is the masked image. Let me try to get a little more straight onto it. It looks a little washed out in this video, but anyway, you can see it. And also over here is a little text panel that talks about how those two paintings I mentioned influenced Pollock. And then we've also got some drawings. I don't want to move too fast. Liz doesn't want me to get, let you guys get too dizzy. I got dizzy the other day. <laughs> when you go too oh, fast. <laughs> well, here, I'll take you and show you the, the little drawing from the Metropolitan Museum, which has the Picasso-influenced imagery. And of course, Another one where you can just see the, the bull was a very important motif for both Pollock and Picasso. And animals in general were favorite motifs for both of them. Of course, Picasso was crazy about the bullfight, which I'm not, <laughs> but anyway, here are some more examples. Those two are the heads that flank the central picture were Picasso's studies for details of Guernica. He did a whole, in fact, the exhibition uh, in 1939 included not only the mural itself, but many, many of these studies and preliminary drawings and subsequent drawings based on the imagery. Now, the one in the middle is a Pollock, and you can clearly see that this kind of distortion and simplification and very strong emotional content is coming from Picasso. We have a few drawings as well. Some of these small studies also in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. And these include, you see that sort of pointy tongue that was such an important Picasso motif. Well, here it is again in Pollock. Now in, in 1939, 1940, when he would have been doing these works, he was in Jungian analysis. He had a psychoanalyst, or actually was a psychiatrist, he was a doctor, who had been an analysand of Jung. And he, Pollock would take his drawings to the analysis sessions. And here is one of them. I'm sorry about the, the glare. But he wouldn't talk about himself to the psychiatrist. So the psychiatrist said, well, I can't help you if we can't have a conversation. Why don't you bring your drawings in and we'll talk about them. 
So they would discuss, let me see if I could get it without the glare. No, afraid not. But you can see this is another tortured animal that obviously has Picassoid overtones. But the idea of the Jungian symbolism, the material from the collective unconscious was one of the topics that they talked about a lot. Here's another one, maybe you can see this one a bit better. Yeah, so this is the kind of thing that Pollock was doing in 1939, 1940, when he was in analysis. And I think that these drawings show very strongly that he was actually an excellent draftsman, but uh, clearly someone who was not drawing directly from life. He was drawing out of his imagination. And his imagination lent itself to these kind of um, distortions and expressionistic images that ultimately he did a whole series of them before he started doing the poured paintings for which he became famous. So the, the figurative aspect and the semi-abstract aspects of Pollock's work are not as well known, but this gives you a sense of where he was coming from creatively and how he used the influence of Picasso to as a springboard for his own, ultimately his own unique form of expression. Um, Helen, there's a there's a question um, in the chat. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Who currently owns Guernica? It belongs to the Museo um, Reina Sofia in Madrid, and uh, it <laughs> when Picasso was alive, you see that the Republicans lost the war to the Nationalists, and uh, Francisco Franco became the dictator of Spain, and. Picasso said that Guernica would never go to Spain as long as Franco was alive. And he outlived Picasso by two years. So in uh, the 19, late 1970s, after both of them died, the United States government had negotiated with Picasso personally to hold the painting in trust. And after his death, his estate negotiated with uh, the Spanish government to I was going to say repatriated, but it was not created in Spain and it never went to Spain until after his death. So it did go in 1981. It uh, was rolled up and shipped to Spain and it now resides in the Reina Sofia. Thank you. Um, that was very interesting. That was my well, question. Well, Thank you. Most welcome. Any other questions for anybody? Any hands up? Feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions. Um, when did Picasso, um, excuse me, Pollock come into his own as far as drip paintings and so on? Like what year did he start doing this? Well, I, I don't know how many of you have seen the, the Pollock film by Ed Harris. Uh, right. which was made, he, it was shot partly here on this site in uh, 1999, it was released in 2000. And it shows him going to the studio here uh, in 1947, putting a canvas on the floor that he had already painted in a more conventional way, and then kind of drooling a little bit of paint on the floor <laughs> next to it. And that's sort of like the eureka moment. Oh my gosh, this would be great. Well, uh, it wasn't like that. <laughs> but it was a Hollywood movie. They only had two hours. You know, they, ha they had to compress things. He actually first used liquid material in 1936 when he was part of a, uh, an experimental workshop with the Mexican muralist David Alparo Siqueiros. And Siqueiros was very experimental and he did not like conventional materials. He told his, the, the young men who were working with him, they were making banners and floats for the communist May Day Parade in New York. And they said, well, just, you know, do whatever you want. We're gonna throw this away after the, after the uh, parade. So, you know, just enjoy yourselves. So they used all kinds of unconventional materials and they used liquid paint that was fast drying and it was very colorful. So that was his first introduction to it. Then he was reintroduced to it by the surrealists. Uh, the idea of, of uh, splashing paint and uh, they used to uh, hang it from a, uh, put a string on a can and 
swirl it around, that kind of stuff to get whatever comes out. And then you work with that. You go, you go beyond that. But for Pollock, really, 1946, late 46, early 47, after he moved here, was when it became his primary material. But he was experimenting with it for on and off for about 10 years. Wow. Okay, we have another question. Can you describe what's behind you? Oh, <laughs> the kitchen. Uh, what you see uh, on my, uh, on your right, my left, is a, a kiosk, which since we don't have their artwork, when we do tours, we have work on the kiosk where people, it's a touch screen and they can scroll through Pollock and Krasner's Earth uh, on their own. But behind me are the appliances and the um, everyday objects that were left here when Lee Krasner died. We did inherit the property intact from her estate. So we got all the knickknacks, all the furnishings, all the personal possessions that were in the house when she died. But actually over here on the wall is a Pollock print in 1945, 40, uh, early 40, late 44, early 45. He was doing some engravings at a workshop that was more or less across the street from his uh, studio on 8th Street. And several of them were reprinted after his death. So we have copies of these posthumous uh, editions of his 1940s prints. And that they also show the influence of Picasso, so they're part of the exhibition. If anyone would like to go into more depth, you can go to the exhibition website. That's Picasso in Pollock, all one word, picassoinpollock.org. And you'll see everything that was in the show. There's a wonderful essay by Pepe Carmel, who is one of the primary Pollock and, and Picasso scholars. And um, you can also see the installation in a 3D version on a platform called Artland, which is linked in, in the website. Okay, Jackie, she had a question. Her hand is up, Jackie Day. Uh, yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was struck by the ideas that Pollock had adapted um, being influenced by Guernica for the Peggy Guggenheim townhouse. And although the final painting that he did as you said, is very different. It right. felt to me as though some of the same emotion and some of the same feeling uh -huh. is in that painting as in the earlier sketches. Well, remember, Picasso was also doing a very expressionistic curvilinear work. I mean, yeah, he did everything. As, as Pollock said, the guy missed nothing. And the show in 1939 had over 300 examples in it. I mean, soup to nuts. So there really were a lot of alternatives, but Guernica as a, as a mural, as something that really fills a wall space was the obvious uh, model because that was what the Pollock had to do was to fill a wall. Uh, fortunately, he did it on the stretched canvas rather than directly on the wall. And Peggy did that deliberately because she didn't own the building. She was only renting it and she knew she wasn't going to be there permanently because she wanted to return to Europe as soon as the war was over. So she was not going to stay in New York. So for her uh, to commission it as a portable mural, the same as Guernica was also a portable mural, uh, meant that it could be moved. And of course it was moved and it went to the University of Iowa in 1959. She donated it to them. Jackie, any other questions? No, thank you, no. Okay. Okay, so uh, Roger asks, who manages the Pollock Krasner Estates today? The Pollock Krasner Foundation is the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the successor to her estate. Uh, they are headquartered in Manhattan and their primary purpose is to give grants to needy and worthy artists. And they've been doing this for over 35 years. Uh, they give away a couple of million dollars every year and they do it internationally. So it has been a tremendous boon to artists all over the world. And I, I take my hat off to Lee because, you know, she and Jackson were supported by the WPA throughout the 1930s. They got $23.86 a week to do their work. And you could live on that back then. Now it's coffee money, but still, this was a godsend. And when she 
was planning what to do with her legacy. She wanted to be able to, to help artists the way she was helped. What could be more valuable to an artist than to buy them some time so that they can do their work without commercial pressure? And that was her, that was her aim. And she succeeded in doing that. The estate has been extremely well managed. It's grown in spite of the fact that they give away a lot of money every year. And they actually were very generous to us as well, even though, as I say, we're not directly affiliated with them, but they have been very, very strong partners in the whole endeavor. Okay. Any other questions, anyone? Oh, did they have children? Someone asks. Oh, yeah. A lot of people ask that. Uh, no, they had no children, but they did have siblings. She, uh, she had six siblings. He, uh, she was one of six. He was one of five brothers and they had children. And so there are nieces and nephews. All of that generation are now dead, but there are nieces and nephews who occasionally come to visit us. And of course, it's wonderful to have a relationship with family members. And they've also been very generous to us. They've given us back articles of uh, things that were in the house uh, that migrated to them and then came back. And also other things that were in the family that never were here. We have some beautiful bedspreads that were made by uh, Jackson's mother, Stella. She was a, a really exquisite craftswoman. And they're, I, I don't know how she did it. They're crocheted to a fairly well. They're so delicate, but those were given to us by one of the cousins. Very nice. Did, um, is there, are there plans for another exhibit at the Paula Krasner house, Jackie? Asks. Yes, we have two more shows coming up. We do two shows a year. And in the spring, we'll have a show of work by Terry Netter who some of you may remember was the director of the Stoller Center and back before it was the Stoller Center, he was the founding director of what was then the Fine Arts Center. And he uh, was a painter and a close friend of Lee's. It's a complicated story, which I, I won't go into. You'll have to come and see the exhibition, but uh, we're doing a show of his paintings that were reworked. This was something that Lee did almost habitually. She constantly reworked her stuff. And I don't know whether Terry was inspired by her to do it, but the paintings that we're showing are works that uh, have had an earlier life. And they're lent to us by his, his widow. He died a couple of years ago, but he was actually the person responsible for getting this property for Stony Brook because he knew that Lee wanted an organization, a nonprofit to take it over, but she didn't want her own foundation to run it. Uh, so Terry persuaded the then president, Jack Marburger to get involved and Jack was receptive and saw to it that the Stony Brook Foundation became the owner. Oh, and then we have another show uh, that's actually a WPA based show in coming up in August. We do the shows for three months each. We start in May, we have one May, June, July, that will be the Terry Netter show. And then August, September, October, we have uh, a, a classmate of Pollock's from high school named Harold Lehman. And his work, he did WPA murals and he also worked in the Siqueiros workshop with Jackson. So we're gonna have a show of his work. Uh, all of this information is on our website. That's pkhouse.org. We would love to have you come and visit us. Uh, we will, of course, have COVID restrictions yet again, but we have, we'll have a booking service on the website and you can just make your, your tour reservation and come and visit us. We would love to see you. I have two other questions. Um, mm -hmm. Did Pollock have a mental illness? Uh, he was never properly diagnosed, although his Jungian psychiatrist said he was not schizophrenic. Uh, he was not bipolar. As far as we know, uh, he, he did suffer from depression, but the psychiatrist said that it was his art that kept him sane. And he himself said, painting is no problem. The problem is what to do when you're not painting. In the studio, he was fine but he obviously had personality issues and he was a serious alcoholic. So there were health problems as well as emotional problems. But as an artist, of course, he overcame that in his work. And I think that's, that's a very interesting um, way of dealing with your problems. Shut yourself in your studio, 
and work on what you what you feel comfortable with, and then you come up with something that's that's really significant. Um, someone named iPad Two has their hand up. I don't know the name. <laughs> so if you want to unmute and ask your question, yeah, that's Barbara Pollock because she can't figure out. I'm sorry, how to... I'm having a hard time hearing you. You can hear me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can't figure out how to get my name on there. So that's why it says I, I can do. That, that's another story. Yeah, I, just, I just did it for you. <laughs> Thank Go you. Ahead. How many paintings did uh, Pollock produce? Well, he started painting. He actually started as a sculptor. When he was in high school, he studied sculpture and he actually did a little apprenticeship with a sculptor, told his father that's what he was going to be. But when he got to New York and studied with Thomas Hart Benton, he went to painting. And starting in, oh, say 1930, when he first was Benton's student, through uh, 1955, which is his last known painting, there are about 380 paintings. Uh, this is This is, totally, you know, the whole gamut. But there are also some works that are, you might consider paintings, but they're on paper. There's a painting on glass that's considered a collage rather than a painting. The, the, the categorizations are a little bit odd, but I guess you could say there may be roughly 400 paintings. And where are the majority of them hanging? I'm sorry? Where are the majority of them hanging? Uh, the largest collection is the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Museum of Modern Art. Now they have about 13 paintings, but they also have works on paper. They have prints. They have. They don't have any of his sculpture. He did do some sculpture, but not much. They don't have that, and they don't have a collage. But they have works in all the other media, and they have the most comprehensive collection. The largest collection in terms of numbers is at the Met because they have a lot of drawings and sketchbook pages, but they only have four, four oils, I believe. Thank you. You're welcome. Does the family keep any of their works? The family? The yeah, the nieces, uh, nephews, or whoever. Yes, they did. From time to time, you'll see one come up for auction that will have X collection of a family member. And I think, you know, a couple of family members still do have some pieces, but most of them have migrated. Yeah. Uh, someone in the chat, uh, Denise, she said, it, there's a famous netter who did anatomical drawings. Any All relation? Right. Uh -huh. Any yeah, relation? Dr. Netter. Uh, I believe they, they are related. I think there may be, a, he maybe was a cousin. I'm not sure. I asked Terry one time about that because my brother is a medical illustrator. And uh, he said he thought he was related. And then Barbara asks, what if any influence, if any influence did Pollock and Krasner have on each other's work? That's a great question because here they were, now they did not work in the same studio. They worked in, uh, in, in uh, I guess, adjoining studios. Uh, when they lived in New York, she, she was on East 9th Street, he was on East 8th Street, and she kept that studio for a while after she started living with him. But then she had, she kind of moved her workspace into his apartment. She had a room at the back, he had the room at the front. And then when they moved out here, in, in the first year, they had to work in the house. They didn't own it, they rented it. And they couldn't fix it up until they were able to buy it. They had to get a loan from Peggy Guggenheim to make that happen, which they did. But in the first winter and spring, they moved here in November, if you can imagine. Whoa, boy. Anyway, it was tough, uh, as Jackson said, a little tough on a city slicker. Because even though he was born out west and lived in, on ranches and farms when he was growing up, he had been in Manhattan since he was 18. So, and Lee, of course, was a native. She was a Brooklyn girl and um, they were living on 8th Street and they did actually have plumbing in the apartment, but they did not have plumbing here in this house. Not full plumbing until 1949. So it was a bit like camping out, but they had, she had a studio kind of like where you saw the exhibition, that was her workspace. And then upstairs in a bedroom was where Pollock worked. Then he converted a barn on the property to become his studio. And then she moved up into the bedroom studio. 
So they both had separate spaces. They only went into each other's workspace by invitation, but they did have a lot of back and forth, a lot of give and take. Although as Lee put it, they didn't really talk about specifics. They were more supportive in that she would say, oh, I'm having a problem. I can't get it. I don't know what I'm doing. And he would come up to the studio and he would say, "That's keep at it. Just keep at it or set that one aside and do another one. You know, that kind of encouragement rather than, oh, you should change this line or I don't like that blue, you know, not the, the kind of housekeeping that some artists do with each other. But this was really a, a very strong give and take relationship and one of mutual encouragement. Nice, very nice. Uh, this is unrelated, but Gerald asks, um, I just became aware of your art murder mysteries. Can you tell us how you got into this genre besides writing about Pollock? That's, that's another good question. I really don't know. I, I enjoy reading mystery novels. And I guess I just, it's it sort of like, when I was a kid, my mother used to do the crossword puzzle and I and she would ask me about words. I think, Ma, I'm reading the paper here, you know, get your own word. And but pretty soon I became a crossword puzzle fanatic. So I guess from reading a certain number of mystery novels, I just thought I could do this. And especially when you read one and you see, oh, that's improbable. You know, that's not working. There's something it's too coincidental. You think, oh, I could have done that better. And then okay, I tried to do it. So I hope I did better, but I have enjoyed it very much. I have three of them that have been published and I've finished a fourth one and I'm working on a fifth one now. Wow, very good. Any other questions? That's all that's in the chat. Any other questions, anyone? No, I think we answered them all. Helen, that was wonderful. It was nice to see the, to see the museum. I mean, that we haven't been there. It's nice to kind of see what it's like and, and I had, met, no, I had actually, it's comfortable you know it's very domestic it's very much you mm -hmm. know a living environment and we of course can't keep it exactly the way it was when Lee and Jackson were here we obviously have you know health and safety issues that we have to address but it has the atmosphere of a comfortable well-lived-in home and I think that helps to humanize the art when you see the artwork, especially abstract art in a museum, it's divorced from the context of, in which it was created. And the environment here, the, the, well, you didn't see the landscape. We have a beautiful piece of property that, that fronts on Akabonic Creek. So you have the water in the background, you have the woods. It's really a very inspirational site. And a lot of artists do come here to get inspiration, not just from Jackson and Lee, but from the surroundings. And I think that it does help for people to appreciate where the art was made in order to appreciate what was made even better. And we're part of a, of a network of historic artists, homes and studios around the country. And there, each one of them is unique. Each one of them has its own atmosphere. Some of them have a significant body of the artist's work too, unlike us. But every single one of them gives you an insight into the creative process. And I think it's, that's one of the, the primary values of this kind of historic preservation. So Helen, one question, when, when members or anyone comes to visit and you know, take a tour, do they actually get to see the, muse the, the barn? Oh yeah. Yep, yeah. the barn is, uh, is uh, exhibit A because we have Pollock's painting floor and Krasner's painting walls. So you actually see the residue from uh, what both of them created in that space because the floor was covered during a renovation in 1953. Masonite was laid down over the wood floor surface on which Pollock painted almost all of his most famous poured paintings. So it was just protected and sealed in, not, not, to, not to preserve it, but just when the building was winterized, this surface was added. And then Lee worked on the walls after Jackson's death. So you see the, the splashes and, and the residue of her energetic action paintings all over the walls. And on the floor, you see this beautiful tracery. Well, you could see the scarf that I'm wearing. This is from one of the poured paintings. This one's in the Boston Museum. But the, all of the ones that were laid out flat on the floor 
and then he would walk around them, paint from all four sides, and the colors and the gestures would spill over the edges. So it's, it's a lot of fun to identify where different paintings were lying when he was working on them. And the same with Lee, we can see the outlines of some of her most famous pictures up on the walls. And then if you really want to get into the weeds, you can take the virtual reality tour. Now that, you put a headset on and you feel like you're back in the studio in the 1940s and 50s when Pollock was working there. Some of his paintings come back and lie on the floor where they were painted, and he talks about them. And then it transitions to the 1960s. Some of Lee's paintings come back and they go up on the wall, and she talks about her work. So that's another 15 minute added to the one hour tour. But that, really, that yeah. puts you back into the picture, literally, as it was when they were working there. And that's all in person, the virtual, re yeah, the virtual reality would be in person. You, you, well, you can actually get it online if you have the equipment. Uh, if you go on our, our website and, and go under news, there are links to where you can download it. Wow, technology is amazing, huh? Well, it, it enabled you. us to do something that we couldn't do otherwise. We are right. never going to get these pictures. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just impossible for us to show major Pollocks and major Krasners. We just don't have the facilities for it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it would be a very different kind of museum. So we send people to MoMA. But if you really want to see how the studio functioned and what they did in that space, then the virtual reality is a great way to do it. I mean, I'm all for in-person viewing <laughs> of the art yeah. and of the, the site. But this is like an extra that gives you a different kind of insight. Nice. Very nice. Thank you, Helen. This was wonderful and really insightful. So I think the members enjoyed it. I see many, many um, uh, comments coming in. They, they appreciate it. And, and oh, thank you. Again nice. for joining thank us. you very much. Thank you very much. It was thank so you. interesting. Really very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.